don't know about you, but I sure do appreciate these guys who lead us in worship every week. Will you join me in just showing your appreciation for them? You know, you need to know that there, there are some of us who were paid to be here for three services, but there are a lot of us who were not. And I really appreciate the sacrifice of these guys spending their time here on a Sunday and helping leading us in worship. I love that song that we just got through singing about how there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. And boy, that is so true. We see throughout the scripture that there is power to break the chain of sickness and power to break the chain of demon possession and power to break the chain of sin and oppression. And even today, we know in the name of Jesus, there is power to break uh, the chain of addiction and those types of things. But boy, what an incredible truth to know that once we were lost in sin, once we were trapped in sin, in the name of Jesus, we absolutely can be set free. One of the things, though, that I believe we struggle with in the Christian life is really what that freedom entails. We know about liberty in Christ. Because of Jesus, we are no longer under the law. Now we are set free. Now we have a liberty in him. But what exactly does that liberty mean? I want to ask you a question tonight. I want you to think about it. When it comes to the Bible, this book, is this book filled with everything black and white? Or are there some gray areas in it? And that's kind of one of those questions that make us a little bit nervous because you certainly don't want to be wrong when it comes to the Bible, but let me help you. There are some gray areas in the Bible. And those are the areas that we really struggle with. Now, some places in the Bible say, do this and don't do that, and it's pretty clear. There's some no-brainers. But then there are some other parts of the Bible that doesn't just give us specific guidelines or specific things of do this or do that when it comes to everyday life. And so it can be difficult for us to navigate through those gray areas. In fact, a great question to ask is how in the world do you navigate through the gray areas in life? And the answer to that simply is through the principles that we find in the Scripture. Now, when you think of the Bible, I want you to think of it this way. The Bible is filled with what's called precepts and principles. Precepts are the black and white, the hard and fast, the no-brainers, things like the Ten Commandments. You know, nobody has to tell you. you I mean, you know from the Scripture you're not supposed to steal. You know you're not supposed to covet. You know you're not supposed to bear false witness. That's the black and white. Those are the precepts. Principles, though... Principles are foundational truths upon which we develop a belief system. And so much of what we deal with in everyday life really falls kind of in that area, the gray area, one could say. It falls in that area of needing to rely upon the principles of the Word of God. Now today, as we continue our study of Peter, a life restored, remember what Jesus is doing in Peter's life. Jesus' plan is to turn this man named Simon into Peter, to turn him into a rock. And Jesus really is discipling the disciples, Peter being really the chief of those. And Jesus' purpose is to make them uh, where they are usable to him after his resurrection and ascension as they are to carry out the ministry and the mission of Jesus. Quite a task that he's given them. And so we're watching the restoration process of Peter and really in turn the other disciples as well as he's shaving off some of the sharp edges on them. Peter, remember, has a tendency to be very brash. He has a tendency to say things without really thinking through them, even to do things without thinking through them. Peter's a take charge kind of a guy. He's a person who's willing to make a decision and just deal with the consequences. Now, I want you to understand that God has actually made him that way. God has given him some leadership attributes that are, boy, he's really going to use those. However, just like with all of us, the gifts and abilities that God give us, unless they are surrendered to him, those very gifts and abilities can become kind of an Achilles heel to us. And so in the passage we're going to look at today, we are going to look at I guess you could call it kind of a gray area. 
we're going to look at where Jesus faces a decision about a liberty, and he uses it to teach Peter a very important lesson on how to navigate through those liberties and gray areas, particularly as it relates to learning how to deny himself take up his cross and follow Jesus. So let's look together. Matthew chapter 17, we pick up the story in verse 24. It says, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And he said, yes. I want to stop here and make sure we understand context. This tax is not a Roman tax like other places we see in the Gospels. This is a Jewish tax. It goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 30 when uh, Moses was instructed to lead the people in the building of the tabernacle. And then he ordered for the men above the age of 20 to pay a tax for the, the worship of the tabernacle and all of the things that they would use for that. And the tax was a half of a shekel. Interestingly, in Nehemiah chapter 10, As Nehemiah had come back to Jerusalem, the temple had been rebuilt, and Nehemiah was a part of rebuilding the walls, he began to institute a temple tax for the things regarding the worship in the temple. However, that tax was reduced to a third of a shekel, probably because the people had been in captivity for so long and they didn't just have quite as much. But it seems that this tax is not a compulsory tax. It's not mandated. They weren't going to go to prison if they didn't pay it. However, it was one of those deals where, well, you just ought to. It would look awfully bad for you not to pay the tax. Now, there's no question that these collectors who were asking Peter this question about whether or not Jesus pays it, there's no question that they're trying to find some reason to accuse him of something. So they come to Peter and they say, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And Peter answers, yes, of course he does. Now, the hilarious thing about that to me in this verse, as we'll see in just a minute, Peter doesn't really know. He's just that kind of guy who's got to say something. He can't stand the silence in the room or he can't stand and not know the answer to a question. So he just takes an assumption and he says, yes, of course he does. But let's pick up the story in verse 25. It says, when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him. I love that. He always knows what's happening before it happens. Jesus anticipated him saying, well, what do you think, Simon? You notice he's not calling him Peter here. It's always a sign for us that this is a teachable moment. This is an opportunity for Jesus to shape him. What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? That's a no-brainer, right? Jesus uses this opportunity to teach him a lesson. What do you think, Simon? Do kings take taxes from their own children Or do they take taxes from the people in the land, from the strangers? Peter answers, of course, verse 26. Well, from strangers. So Jesus says to him, then the sons are free. What's he saying there? Remember, it was Peter himself who we saw just a couple of weeks ago made that incredible declaration. The declaration which we said was the declaration upon which the church is built when Peter said about Jesus, you are the Christ, the son. Remember, not a son. You are the son of the living God. You are in essence. You are God in the flesh. What an incredible declaration. So Peter knows who Jesus is. And so when Jesus says to Peter, well, then the sons are free, essentially what he's saying is, well, I don't have to pay that temple tax, do I? But let's go on. Verse 27. Nevertheless, here's the teaching moment. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. There's really three amazing things in that verse, and I'm going to give you the first two really quickly, but the third is really where we're going to spend most of the rest of our time tonight. One of the things that I want you to see here is, do you see how Jesus teaches Peter a lesson in a way that he can understand. To teach him a lesson, he sends him fishing. Well, that's what Simon Peter did before he started following Jesus, right? 
I think that's one of the reasons why Jesus is called the master teacher. He's so good at it. Of course, he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's quite an advantage. However, boy, we just see his teaching is just remarkable. You know, it's important for us as we try to teach people the scripture, teach people about the gospel, to be able to talk to people in a language that they understand. Jesus talked to farmers about farming. Jesus talked to tax collectors and money folks about money. Jesus talked to fishermen about fishermen. We need to learn to do that as well. Not everybody speaks those languages. Not everybody speaks a been in church all my life kind of language. Not everybody speaks a never been in church at all kind of language. We need to learn how to communicate the truths of the gospel in all types of different languages. But another point that I want to make here is, you know, Jesus is also teaching Peter, you do what I tell you to do, and you can count on me taking care of you. How incredible that was, right, for Peter to go drop a hook in the water, and here comes a fish, and the fish hooks onto that hook, and Peter brings up that fish, and inside the mouth of that fish is a coin. By the way, the Greek translation, from the Greek to the English, that particular word is the word stator, which a stator was a coin that would be the equivalent of the temple tax for two people. He didn't just cover the temple tax for himself. Jesus covered it for Peter as well. And that's really important for Peter to remember because, you know, Jesus is going to die. and He's going to be resurrected. He's going to send up to heaven. Peter and the other disciples are going to be sent out with the mission and ministry of Jesus. And they're not always going to have Jesus right beside them to take them fishing. Not always going to have him right beside them to do all the things that he, they've been able to see him do thus far. They're going to have to trust that if they're obedient to him, that he's going to provide a power that will take care of them, that he'll provide everything that they need. And boy, here's a really good picture of that that they can hold on to in their minds and they can remember when life begins to get a little bit more difficult down the road and they're having to depend on him. But really the area that I want us to focus on tonight is found in that phrase at the beginning of verse 27 where Jesus says, Nevertheless, lest we offend them. The word here for offend in the Greek translated in the English means to trip up as if into sin. So what Jesus is saying here essentially is this. Peter, you know I don't have to pay that temple tax. I am the Son of God. I am God in the flesh. The temple has been built to lead people to worship me. I do not have to pay that temple tax. I have the right to refuse to do so because of who I am. You know that. I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. However, lest this be a stumbling block to them, Let's pay it. Now we're stepping into a principle to help guide us through the gray areas that we experience in life. Because we know as believers, no longer do we have to do things in order to earn the love of God. Now we do things because of the love of God. We know that we are free from the law. That is a precept. However, we also know, conversely, the precept in James chapter 2 that tells us that faith without works is dead. So in other words, we are to live our lives in such a way as to honor Christ. But what's the balance there between the liberties that we have, the places in life where the Bible doesn't just particularly spell out, do this or don't do that, how do we make those decisions in those areas? And we see one principle to help guide us in those decisions is this example of Jesus who tells us not to be a stumbling block in the lives of others. In other words, kind of like Paul told us in Philippians 2, with every decision that we make, that we do it with the attitude of looking out not only for our own interests, but also for the interests of others. Listen to me. Jesus is making a point here that you and I don't like at all, okay? And it's this. Perception does matter. 
it matters. Jesus is also teaching us that the decisions that we make in life are not always decisions between right and wrong, but sometimes they are decisions between good and best. And man, those can be the toughest. You know, Jesus, he could have been offended by the question. How dare they ask whether or not I'm paying that temple tax? Do they not know who I am? I can't believe that they would even ask you that question. There is no way in the world I'm going to pay that temple tax. But the attitude of Jesus is, lest I be a stumbling block. Jesus is teaching Peter that a part of denying self is a willingness to give up your rights for the sake of the gospel. You see, sometimes as Christians who know that we are free in Christ, we hold on to our liberties a little too tightly. I'll give you some ways that you can know if that's something that you're doing. Some people... When they're holding on to their liberties too tightly, it causes them to, well, abdicate some civil responsibilities. Now, I'm sure that's not you. But it may be that there are some who say, listen, I am a, a believer in Christ and therefore I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. I am not from this world. I just live in this world temporarily. My home is in heaven with Jesus. And so, if you go home today and you drive too fast and a police officer pulls you over and he gives you a ticket, then you might would say, well, listen, I appreciate that, sir. Sorry to bother your time, but I don't really live here. I am not a citizen of this kingdom. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So you can just take that ticket and you can just shove it. Well, that would be a, a really dumb thing for you to do, right? But that would be an example of taking liberties too far. Another way you can tell that if your liberties are too important to you is when you become defensive towards them. When you begin to say things like, well, nobody can tell me how I can live my life. Listen, I make my own decisions. If they don't like it, that's just tough. That's just a Baptist thing. That's just a Christian thing. That's just a church thing. And those kind of people make me sick. They need to worry about their own lives. They don't need to worry about mine. I can live however I want to live. I am free in Christ. I have accepted Jesus into my heart. Now, most people, when they say that, honestly, they don't really know what that means. Because to accept Jesus into your heart means that, well, Scripture talks about the heart is the center from which all decisions and emotions flow. So to accept Jesus into your heart means that you have absolutely denied yourself and taken up your cross and followed him. It means he is absolute the boss, the supreme, the ruler of your life. And most people don't really think about it that way. However, I digress. But we may say, well, listen, I've accepted Jesus into my heart and therefore I don't have to do that. I don't have to care what you say. I don't have to, you don't tell me what to do. I can live my life however I want to live it. Well, a person who is defensive is a person who they don't really understand salvation. They don't really understand the teaching of the gospel. And they're holding on to their rights too tightly. You know, I tell my kids, when you're defensive, you've lost before you ever even started. Because defensiveness is generally a sign of conviction. Another way that you can tell that Maybe your rights have become too important to you. It's when you get to the point where you don't even care what people say anymore. Look at the example of Jesus. Did Jesus care? Did he care what the tax collectors believed about him paying the temple tax? You bet he did. And when we get to the point of just shutting everybody out and saying, listen, they need to mind their own business. I can't worry about what other people are saying. I'm going to live my life the way I live it. I have freedom in Christ. Then you, 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 you've gone off the rails as it pertains to your liberties. So what I want to show you tonight is I want us to use principles from the Scripture 
to help us to see what a powerful thing it is when believers take the example of Jesus and are willing to give up their rights for the good of the gospel. Number one, giving up your rights promotes unity. Acts chapter 15 is a great example. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, this is after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, Paul and Barnabas are going to different cities and they're sharing the gospel with Gentiles. Gentiles simply means non-Jews, the people who weren't Jews. And they're seeing them come to faith in Christ at an incredible rate. And the Holy Spirit will descend upon these Gentiles and they will see life transformation happening right before them. And it was an amazing thing. In fact, it was a new thing for these guys to see this happen right there before them. However, there were some Jews, some old hat Jews that were in Jerusalem, and they just believed that a person couldn't really be a part of the kingdom of God unless they were circumcised. So after Paul and Barnabas would come through these cities and see these people celebrate life transformation in Jesus, these Jewish guys would come in from Jerusalem, and they would come to these new believers, and they'd say, listen, no disrespect to Paul and Barnabas, great guys. I know they mean a lot to you, but one thing they didn't tell you, you can't really be a part of the kingdom of God unless you've been circumcised. Well, part of Paul and Barnabas found out about that. They didn't take to that too kindly. There was a lot of dissension among them. So they decided to gather together all of the apostles and the elders of the church in Jerusalem for what is now called the Council at Jerusalem. It's recorded in Acts chapter 15. And when they gathered together, our man Peter, who at this time is a rock, he's a leader in the church, our man Peter stands up at the Council of Jerusalem and he says, listen, fellas, I've seen this for myself. I have seen Gentiles come to faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit come upon them and they not be circumcised and they're just as saved as the rest of us. And then Paul and Barnabas stand up and they begin to share their story as well. And then James, who's the leader of the church in Jerusalem, he says, well, listen, let's settle this issue here once and for all. What they are saying jives with what the Old Testament has told us. So now we can see we have the scripture and we have evidence, eyewitness evidence, that Gentiles can come to faith in Christ without being circumcised. Let's send them a letter and let's encourage them in their faith and let's let them know we don't expect them to be circumcised, but let's add something to the letter. Let's ask them to stay away from food that's been sacrificed to idols, from sexual immorality, and from things that have been strangled with blood. Now, the sexual immorality issue, that's a black and white one, right? That's a precept. However, remember, these Gentiles were coming from pagan backgrounds. Well, that was a part of their worship, so they needed to be reminded of that one. But regarding the meat that had been sacrificed to idols, that was a gray area. That was a liberty. And James is saying to those Gentiles, listen, we're not going to make you be circumcised. We totally get that. But we want to ask you to do this for us. Don't eat that meat that's been sacrificed to idols. Why? Because that would have been a stumbling block to the believing Jews in Jerusalem. You see, giving up their rights promoted the unity of the church. In our deacon retreat a couple of weeks ago, we showed a video of Timothy Keller preaching a message on theological marks of revival. And in that message, he talked about how when the church begins to experience revival, something incredibly powerful happens, and it causes the church to be beautified in the eyes of the community. And what he means by that is the community begins to see that the church is incredibly different than the rest of the world. And it is supremely attractive to the community when they realize the church has something that they don't have. In our world, listen, even in our community, you see lots of divisiveness. You see lots of anger. You see lots of people who are trying to hold on to rights and fighting with each other about that. But when they see in the church of Jesus Christ a people who are willing to give up their rights for the good of the whole in order to promote unity, that is a beautiful thing in the eyes of the world. It's powerful, isn't it? Secondly, giving up your rights provides a hearing before the world. The very next chapter in the book of Acts, chapter 16, is one of the craziest chapters really to me in the Bible. 
Paul and Barnabas have decided to go separate ways, and now Paul takes on Silas as his missionary partner. Barnabas takes on Mark, and they go different ways, sharing the gospel different places. But Paul and Silas, they come to a city, and there's a young man there named Timothy. And Paul really takes a liking to Timothy and believes he can be a great asset to them on their missionary endeavors. But there's a problem with him. His father was a Greek, and everybody knew it. And his mother was a Jew. Because his dad had been a Greek, Timothy was not circumcised. Now, remember Paul, when he'd go on his missionary journeys, he would go to the Jews first, and he would try to open their eyes to the truth of the gospel and how the Old Testament that they held so nearly and dearly to their hearts was always pointing them to the Messiah, and Jesus was that Messiah. But Timothy now, a Greek uncircumcised it'd be hard for them to pay any attention to what he had to say so Paul circumcised Timothy an adult man just so that he would have a hearing before the world as he presented the gospel Now, that's taken things to a whole nother level. But for Timothy, people hearing the gospel was more important to him than his right. Remember, it was just the chapter before where they made the decision that you don't have to be circumcised. Timothy could have said, whoa, man, no, sir, not a chance. No way you're doing that to me. But again, The gospel was more important to him than his rights, and he was circumcised. Now, if you're like me, here we are at point two, and you're already beginning kind of in your mind going, now, hang on a second, Chip, because I can't live my life just bowing to the whims of whomever. There's always going to be somebody who's going to say something. And how in the world do you know whether you're just trying to please people or you're really trying to please God? Because it just can't change all the time. And anticipating you'd have that question, I've got a couple of verses for you from 1 Corinthians 10. Look what Paul writes. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. If you're catering to the whims of people because you're trying to earn friends, well, that's not what the Scripture is talking about. But if you're willing to give up your rights for the sake of not being a stumbling block, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of having a hearing before people, for the sake of unity and the other things we're going to talk about in a moment, then that is what honors the Lord. So motive has everything to do with the decisions that you make. But let's move forward. Giving up your rights also promotes the growth of weaker believers. You do remember, right, when you become a Christian, you become an us, not a me anymore, right? And particularly when you join a church, then we believe what the, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, that God places the members in the body just as he desires, and he's put every member in the body for the profit of all. You are no longer a me or an I, now you are an us. That's why Jesus teaches us in the model prayer, our Father, not my Father, but our Father who art in heaven, because we're in us now. Well, Paul addressed an issue in 1 Corinthians 8, actually about meat that was sacrificed to idols. And the issue was that after that meat had been sacrificed to pagan idols, what was left over was sold in the marketplaces. Some of the weaker believers in Corinth coming from those pagan backgrounds, when they would see that meat in the marketplace, oh man, that was abhorrent to them because it reminded them of the life that they used to live. Very similar maybe to how an alcoholic would view a bar or alcohol because it was just a bad reminder of old decisions. But the more mature believers realized that they were free in Christ, that salvation wasn't about what you put in your body. Righteousness and holiness and those things, that's a, well, 
describe more by what comes out of your body than what goes in it. So for them, that was the most ridiculous thing in the world. When they would go to the marketplaces to get meat, they weren't concerned what God that meat had been sacrificed to. They just wanted hamburger. That's all they wanted. And so they would kind of begin to be argumentative about it and say, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. Those people just need to grow up. I mean, salvation's got nothing to do with what you eat. That is just crazy, and I can't worry about that. All of chapter 8 is Paul's going, wait a second, don't you remember we're a we? We're not a you or an I or a me anymore. Paul actually kind of wraps up chapter 8 and he gives this incredible verse where he says, you know what? If what I eat is a stumbling block to men, I will never again eat meat. Give up your rights to promote the growth of weaker believers. Next, giving up your rights glorifies Christ. You see, when we're willing to give up our rights to not be a stumbling block, man, that is showing what the world, the world who Jesus is. Again, let's go back to Philippians 2, where Paul writes, Look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then he goes on to say, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, meaning that he was God in essence, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and took on the form of a bondservant and was made in the likeness of men. So Paul is telling us that Jesus' whole life is built around giving up his rights for the sake of the gospel. That's who Jesus is. And that's what his whole ministry is built on. And so see, for you and me, when we hold on to our rights, when we become defensive about, you don't tell me what to do, or when you begin to say, I don't care what people think, and when we begin to be argumentative about our liberties and our rights and those things become more important to us than the gospel, listen, not only do we see from the teaching of Jesus that we've gotten off the rails with our rights, but it also shows a deficiency in our understanding even of who Jesus is. Because his whole life was about giving up his rights. And then finally, there's a personal benefit to being willing to give up your rights. Giving up your rights protects your heart from the enemy. I'll give you a principle here. Remember the life of David? And of course, you probably, what you most remember about David is David and Goliath, but then you also remember David and Bathsheba. And you remember how the chapter about the adulterous relationship of David and Bathsheba began? It began by talking about it being in the spring of the year when kings would go out to battle. David didn't. Well, it wasn't a sin for David not to go out to battle. He didn't have to. He's king. He had battle people who would go out to battle for him, and that's what he relied on. But he let his guard down a little bit, didn't he? He held on to that liberty that he didn't have to go, his right that he was a king and he could stay and the other people would go. And again, that in and of itself was not sinful. He didn't sin by not going. But boy, it sure was a bad decision at the end, wasn't it? You see, we've got to remember that we do have an enemy, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him. And what he wants to do is he wants to keep you from glorifying God and worshiping him, and he wants to keep others around you from being able to be drawn to God because of your life. And he will do anything he can to just get a little bit of a foothold in you. And see, when we are unwilling to give up our rights, when our rights, our liberties are more important to us than people, when we get to the point where we really believe that perception doesn't matter, we can live life however we want to live it because we're free in Christ. And the enemy just gets his foot in the door just a little bit. And then our hearts begin to be less guarded than they were before. Uh, I've been reading a book that Tom gave me actually this past week. 
And in the book, it tells the story about this European doctor, and I may not get his name correctly, so please forgive me for my, well, lack of German, or I don't even know if it's German, but the doctor, European language. But his name was Ignaltz Simmelweis, or something like that. And he was a European doctor in the mid-1800s. And he was a doctor at the famed Vienna General Hospital, which was a very important research and teaching hospital in that particular day. He was put in the obstetrician ward. They, he and the other doctors or the students under him would deliver babies. But they had a terrible problem with a collection of symptoms that became known as childbed fever. And the women were dying at an alarming rate. In fact, the mortality rate on his section of the ward was one in 10 women. So one out of every 10 women died giving birth to their baby. It got to be so bad that history records that some of the women who would be forced to go to that hospital, some of the women would deliver their babies in the streets and then go in to the maternity ward. It baffled Dr. Summelweis that the mortality rate was so atrocious. What made it even more strange to him was that there was a sec second section of the ward that was manned by the midwives, and their mortality rate was better. It was 1 in 50. He couldn't understand that at all. So he tried his best to figure out what in the world was the problem, because that's not good for business when you got a 1 in 10 mortality rate and all these women are dying on you. So he decided to standardize some of their procedures. They standardized the diet of the women who would be given birth. They standardized the positions that the women would give birth in. They standardized the way that they did their laundry, trying to figure out what in the world could cause this mortality rate to improve, but nothing was working, and he was baffled. Dr. Summerweiss finally decided he needed to take a step back for a while, and he stepped away for a few months and went and visited another hospital, but realized that in his absence, the mortality rate began to improve, and that really bothered him. So as he came back, he began to really pay closer attention to see what in the world could be the problem. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on him. As a research and teaching hospital, he realized that many of the doctors in his particular ward spent a lot of their time working on cadavers and would go from working on the cadavers to delivering babies without ever washing their hands. Now, remember, this is the mid-1800s, so they didn't understand things quite as much. So he imposed on the doctors in his ward that they would have to wash their hands in a chlorine and lime solution when they left the cadaver lab to go and deliver babies. All this time, this European doctor was trying to figure out what in the world was the problem. He knew there was a problem, and he just couldn't put his finger on it. And then it finally dawned on him, the whole time, he was the problem. I want us to take a step back for a minute as we close. We live in a world that is incredibly broken, don't we? We have family members, and we have friends, and we have neighbors whose lives are absolutely broken. And sometimes we don't know what in the world has caused things to be the way they are. What if we took a step back and asked ourselves the question, could it be that I'm the problem? If you've asked anybody to come with you to church in a while, 
or if you've tried to share your faith with someone in a while, I'd be willing to bet that the number one statement of resistance that you get is, I don't know. I've been around church before and I don't know, church just always seems to be filled with a bunch of hypocrites. Could it be that our liberties have become more important than the gospel? Perception does matter. Boy, this is a lesson Peter needed to learn. Peter, with that take charge personality, with that type of personality that's willing to make a decision and let the consequences fall where they may, the guy who is willing to say something when nobody else wanted to say anything and do something when nobody else was willing to do anything, I mean, the boy was born to be a leader. But man, if his life wasn't surrendered to God, he was sure going to get himself into a whole lot of trouble and do more harm to the gospel than help. Peter needed to learn, and so do we, how to navigate those gray areas, how to make decisions on those areas in life where the Bible doesn't just come out and say, do this and don't do that. And at the end of the day, what we see from Jesus, whose life, again, by the way, was all about giving up his rights for the sake of the gospel. What we need to learn is that sometimes we need to be willing to give up things that aren't even sin. For the sake of the name of Jesus being exalted. Because sometimes we can be the problem and we don't want that to be the case. May nothing in our lives ever be more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ and seeing people come to him. Let's pray. Father, as we wrap up tonight, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come here together and to learn how to navigate through gray areas, helping us to see that it's, it's all about motive. It's all about learning to deny self. And Father, thank you for showing us tonight that denying self is bigger than just leaving a fishing job. It's bigger than just leaving hopes and dreams. It's bigger than leaving our life plans and goals. The denying self sometimes means the willingness to give up things that in and of themselves aren't wrong. Denying self is a willingness to give up our liberties, a willingness to give up our rights for the sake of the gospel. Help us, O oh Lord to learn how to live our lives on a daily basis in a way that points people to you, in a way that beautifies the church, in a way that is attractive to a broken world. For it's in your name we pray.